Thank you, everybody. Hello, welcome. Um, super excited to be here. Like Rick said, after coming over and working with Pocona for a long time and presenting at the conferences and just being a part of that, it's a little different, but super excited to be coming on board and working with them and all the super smart people. You know, I, I've done that before. So we're near the end, we'll, like one more session, we'll be wrapping up 28 hours straight for Pocona Live online so far. Um, you know, I think that's pretty impressive. So sorry that we're not all in Amsterdam together, but last, maybe we'll do that next year, but I'm glad we're all here together. So um, just to let you know, we're gonna be talking primarily, obviously about the state of MongoDB, a little bit about the open source community and kind of where we're gonna go from, from there. So just next things up, gonna be a little bit about me. We've already talked about a little bit, um, but we'll go ahead and, and hit it a little more. So, I'm an employee for Procona now, like I said, but before this, I was working for Electronic Arts for Bioware um, and then for Object Rocket Rackspace. Talk about baptism by fire. That's what the little frying pan is there for. You get to learn a lot of MongoDB, a lot of different environments, a lot of different use cases, and a lot of different really interesting problems that came up to, to solve there. Um, doing the MongoDB for about seven years, Oracle, significantly long time before that super interested in emerging and disruptive technologies. As you can see here, you know, AI, machine learning, deep learning, finding new use cases, you know, FinTech, blockchain, et cetera. So really great to come over. And now we're gonna go ahead and get started with talking about the state for the day. So here are the three main areas we're gonna to discuss today. You can see it here, the state of MongoDB today, the open source community around MongoDB and then MongoDB specifically here at Bracona. Okay, so the state of MongoDB today. Um, what's it doing? Recent spread and growth. What does the competitive landscape look like? And what kind of changes and new features are going on? So there are quite a few new features recently with version 4.4, but even more to come. So. So first of all, some people say, okay, there are all these other NoSQL databases that are out there. And is MongoDB still good? Well, MongoDB since 2013 has continued to grow and to expand and just keep going. You see how, how far it is there and that's on DB Engine's ranking. And then you can see as well, going back here, you can see that, hang on just a second. You can see that the number of times alone. So down the, downloaded 50 to 35 million times alone last year. Okay. So that's what that looks like just in terms of its growth. And then two, if you look at the DB Engine's ranking here, you'll see in the top 10 databases, MongoDB is number five. And that's pretty impressive. This is an all databases, no SQL and relational databases with their huge head start. In just the quote unquote document store, actually, let me go back for just a second here. So you see here MongoDB, but you also see Elasticsearch and Cassandra. So technically speaking, those are the top in the top 10. And then going ahead to the 15 document store databases, you'll see the ones that are in, in there for, for no SQL. Now, Technically speaking, Cassandra is, is not a document store database, but it is one of the main competitors in many people's minds, the column store, right? And then Elasticsearch also is not one of the ones that is listed as a document store, but it doesn't matter. The point here is that MongoDB outpaces the other document stores by far. Okay. So it takes us back to the question, MongoDB is still very heavily favored by developers. This is in a recent Motley Fool article that we got this particular quote from, though that I pulled it from. Um, 65,000 developers, that's a lot. So Mo MongoDB is the most wanted database during the quarter. And it continues to be placed well with all the major cloud providers. That said, MongoDB still only has 1% of the global database market. So there's a long room for it, long way for it to grow, even with all the other players that are in the market as well. 
what is driving the growth? Well, there's a lot of things driving the growth, but basically it's the continued increase in spread and, and major growth of, of the amount of data that's out there. Okay. So just if you look from 2010 until 2025, we're supposed to get to 175 zettabytes. Now think about that. Zettabyte is a trillion gigabytes. So this explosive growth, if you watch that curve, it's not going to work anytime soon. <coughs> IDC, IDC is the one who gave us a lot of these particular information about the growth overall and where it's coming from. So when we get to 2025, we'll have one data interaction every 18 seconds. And a lot of that's gonna be driven by, of course, devices, IoT, um, you know, device data. And that's a common use case for MongoDB, right? Throw into that, the iPhone 12 just came out. 5G is going to be coming into play. There's gonna be more and more data. And a lot of this data is gonna be real-time data processing. It's not gonna be just data warehouse or analytics, et cetera. So MongoDB is a good place for that particular data set. So what is MongoDB doing to handle all the growth? What are they doing to, to continue to grow and to continue to get better? Well, they've been busy. Um, you know, these are the changes since November of 2016. As you can see, there are a lot of them. A lot of them kind of build on each other. Obviously, it's, it's something that's meant to make the amount of work done. But I would say that 4.0 4.2 were much more major releases than 4.4. You'll see the green splotches here that represent the things that are kind of more important to a lot of our users in a lot of different use cases as well. So there's also been some changes and things that are taken out in terms of commands that people have gotten used to, right? Like for example, clone collection, all right? Then they've also done some plan catch list if you were used to query shapes, some of the it's regular tools that you're doing. One thing that's interesting to note, if you'll take a look at the fail on index key too long, no, that's been around for quite a long time, but in 4.2, they removed that restriction that, and primarily, you know, you sit there and you look about it, think about it, they're going to say, okay, that's probably going to be related to the fact that they're now going to have compound hash sharp keys, and so they need to have, have the ability to have them longer. And so that's what we're going to talk about next here. All right, so the new features and improvements of note, the ones that, that we feel have come are important and that the people that I talk to and my peers are important, refinable shard keys, define and refine with no, no downtime. Of course, that has its own caveats. The compound hash shard keys, hedge reads, closest, nearest, the idea there to reduce latency. I had talked about that earlier on and we'll be doing a blog on that coming up mirrored reads, which really is about preheating your shard so that your cache is warmed up in case you have a failover or in case you need it for any other reason. Renew, resumable initial sync. People who have to do a lot of backups and a lot of you know, refills will love this. Um, it will be useful in a lot of different backup strategies. And then of course, performance improvements all the way along the line in terms of streaming replication, but simultaneous indexing. And so this is one that's kind of interesting building on the primary and the secondary at the same time. The idea is it's supposed to reduce chance for replication lag, but a potential concern there is you look at it and you say, hey, I needed that to be backwards because I didn't need both my primary and the secondary to fail at the same time. But if I need to have an election, what if I need to fail over there? So now we're going to talk about these in a little more uh, detail here. Now that I'm finally starting to get my, my voice back there. So ref refinable shard keys, um, great. What if it was caused because what if you had a huge shard imbalance that you were trying to fix and this is due to a bad shard key selection to start with? Where does that, where's that going to put you? It causes jumbo chunks, right? If you had low cardinality, for example, a customer with many orders or one Instagram that's super pop, more popular, an influencer, um, a TikTok person that that particular gets so many, much many more hits than anybody else. You have a problem there because you didn't add in enough cardinality, enough distinctiveness in your initial shard key. For example, an example of that would be if for, you use a social media tag as a shard key, 
and then supervisor. So you're gonna modify the shard key to provide better cardinality. You want to add that field, possibly compound shard key and kind of go from there. Okay. Another thing that is there, the compound shard keys themselves. So when you're hash, compound hash shard key is the key there. When you hash it, it's going to skin your shards randomly across, evenly distributed across all your shards. Um, the problem that you can run into there is if you do that and you don't use your shard key in your query, then you can do a lot of scatter gathers. But this is still in place and it's normally hot, shards, hot sharding. Okay. Another example is like data residency. All your data needs to stay in Germany. All your data needs to stay in the UK. Then this allows for random distribution still, but having the processor shards there. All right. So another one, and a big one, so this is one that a lot of people would probably find helpful, is, is the hedge trees. So a hedge to protect yourself. It's not the trees, it's not the bushes. You want to hedge your bets, take a counterbalancing action. And then reads from a computer the definition of terms. It's performed by actions performed by computers to acquire data from a source and place it in their volatile memory for processing. Combine those together, and what does MongoDB say? Submitting read requests to multiple replicas in the sharded cluster and then returning results to the client as soon as the quickest node responds. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that one you know, because it is one that sits somewhat important there. Um, and we're gonna go back there. So high latency, why is it important? It's, it's important because we're talking about latency, okay? And why is latency important? If you have high latency, people are going to stay on your site. They're gonna lose, you're gonna lose revenue. So here's some stats for you. Mobile bounce rates, Google 2019 survey, mobile bounce rates increase by 53% anytime your load, web page load takes over three seconds. Okay. 40% of people will abandon a website if it's three seconds. So they go bye bye. And then slow load times are a primary reason for visitors to abandon the checkout process. So just think about this for a second. You've gone, you've done all the shopping, and maybe you're a particular shopper and you finally have everything you want just in your basket. You're ready to check out on your cart, and then you get there and you keep having to put your information in your cart in, or it takes forever to load, or it takes forever to finish. But you know what? This is e commerce now. This is online shopping. There are other shops out there that are going to have the same, same products that you want. So you're probably going to leave. So hedge reads the whole idea behind them. You're going to reduce the frequency, you're going to look for faster results, and basically you're a lot of times this comes into play when you have network issues, like network latency, or if you have shards that are being hit with heavy writes and you want to move things over to use their secondaries, you have slow disk perhaps. And then the reason you're doing it, you want predictable, reliable performance so that you can start your business. And then also too, you can, during elections of failures, you can continue to do work there. So now we're going to talk about how they work. You know, so how they work. Um, we're going to use a very simplistic model here. Okay. Basically, you know, this is a simplistic model, but of, of a shard. So it's a shard, but it's a replica set, and it has five members. So you have your application with your client drivers in US East. You have your US East query router. Then you have your secondary US East, Frankfurt, US West, U.S. West and London. All right, so that's that's the depiction. So then let's talk about how that's going to work. So when you're using non-primary read preferences, those all nodes except primary, Mongo S processes have to have it enabled for hedge reads. The Mongo S process is going to be responsible for generating the list of eligible secondary members. And so, what's eligible? What's an eligible secondary member? It's going to determine the closest, the lowest average ping time, and then it's going to add that. There's a calculated latency window from that to an average wait time. And then there's a local ping threshold MS, which has a default value of 15 seconds. So this is also the default value for most driver related uh, things there. Okay, so then which members fill it to that window? From the eligible one, the Mongo S going to send queries randomly, just picks one at random, 
And then with hedge reads enabled, because that's what we're talking about, the Mongo S also selects a second one out of the eligible members to send a query to. And that has a threshold max time and that's for that, for the default 150 milliseconds. Great. Once it returns, it cancels your other one. So that's what, that's just what we have talking about there for head reads. So today we got a little bit of a wrinkle. And actually yesterday, this was a little bit of a wrinkle. Uh, we now have the announcement of multi-cloud models and clusters. So of course, I wanted to make sure I gave you some very, very current information and some initial thoughts on this. So multi-cloud strategy, using more than one cloud provider at a time, multi-cloud clusters, just announced yesterday. So this is gonna require some digging into, and obviously we're probably gonna to have to get into it pretty, pretty deeply to understand. And public clouds, cloud providers, cross zones, cross regions, my thoughts, great break, high availability for resiliency, for migrations, uh, a lot of cloud feature options. For example, if you wanted the AI capabilities of Google, um, you're, you're good to go. Data locality, if you have to have, keep your data in the country, or mobility for moving things whenever you want. Under the covers, no, this is not true. Again, these are just some first thoughts just from doing some quick reviews. It's likely using zones and tags. And then of course, there's a multi data center right concern that's custom, will have to come into play. And then the question will be, will this be available outside of Atlas? Based on zones and tags, and then the custom data set, multi data center, that's a possibility. Okay. All right, questions this brings up. Increased latency, depending on the network connections between model PCs. If you can imagine that they might not like this, hey, I'm gonna switch over to this data center. Um, the increased outbound and inbound network traffic, is that going to cause additional money to have to come up and to be a problem? So as you see here, there's a little bit of a crossover between using it as a PowerPoint and using it as a Google slide. But limitations, there are going to be some limitations there. What's gonna happen with your aggregation pipeline? What's gonna happen with transactions? So careful to use both of your read concerns, right? Because there's the issue with retrocausal issues. Uh, Jepson did some tests in 4.2 that had those in play, but didn't come into play um, but later, okay. So what are the changes that are new features that, that we kind of want to take a look at? Change streams are important. A lot of people are using change streams for migration, um, medium time to recover, you know, your time-based offload, that's a huge one. Instead of just figuring out my size, hey, I need a 150 gig offload. Well, no, I want to be able to recover my offload to 24 hours ago or 48 hours ago. Stream topology changes. Tell drivers immediately so that connection can change. Um, faster client authentication, reduce that handshake time. So if it's faster there on the handshake, then your whole process from start to beginning from the client through the app to the database and back your total round trip time should hopefully see an improvement. According to the specs, some people have said that you can expect to see up to a 50% improvement. So again, this is something that I have not personally tested yet. So I'm going with what, what's been said. And then you've got some pretty massive improvements in the aggregation framework. For example, union with. You can also blend your pipeline stage for blend data time series coming out. So these are things you probably wanna take a look at. Custom aggregation expresses, um, more complex ETL joins with JavaScript global read and write concerns. And then we also have two new drivers to play with. Apologies about that. Okay, so two new drivers to play with. All right, so those are some of the new features that you may want to consider. Again, there's pretty some pretty interesting ones, um, the ones that we highlighted that we think that our customers will, will want to play with and to work with, and actually not play with, plays a play word, but to use. So now let's talk about the overall MongoDB open source community and some changes that occurred and, and reactions that have occurred, et cetera. These are the specific things that we will discuss. Okay, the license chains, obviously, community reaction, and then two, what we're hearing, what we're seeing, combinations, and then back to Polyglot. 
So the big change is October of 2018. MongoDB changed its open source license, transitioned to a new server side license. It's ran into a little, quite a little bit of, I don't know what you say, uh, backlash there. And I think that would be a pretty good way to state that. So, I can see on the slide there were definitely some people that were, were upset about it. Red Hat pulled it out of their initial distribution. Um, MongoDB says, okay, they're fine. They want to keep doing it. But the open source community was still pretty unhappy with, with these changes. Why were they so happy? Okay, what happened with this particular change? Well, they alienated their user base. MongoDB has always been about community. You know, the, the originally, the reason for its success was the development of an acceptance of it by the developer base, right? And one of the things we recently did our own Percona uh, 2020 survey, developer database survey, and that just came out. And you'll see, excuse me, you can see there, the, so who gets to choose? And this is a big change. Before it was your CIOs, your DBA managers, your IT directors, your DBAs that were deciding what database technology you're going to use. And here, you see that 41% of the time, it's the architects who are determining it. And 26% of the time, it's developers that are determining this information. So that's a huge change, right? You add that together, and that's what 67% of the time, non-DBAs are, are deciding what database technology is going to be used. So that's, again, that's a huge change. So if you alienated your architect, your developer, your architecture base, Who's going to choose those? You need to say there's been a lot of effort around developer relationships, repairing those, and a lot of work to help rebuild the MongoDB community uh, as a whole. One of the things Percona has always done, obviously, is to continue the close relationship that we have with, with open source. And part of that is, is like a continual give and take that we get information back and forth. And so this allows us to like hear things, uh, to see things, and, and to just kind of get a general idea and a feel for what, what the market. So what we're hearing, we're hearing more and more interest in, in open source MongoDB offerings. We're also seeing more attention for MongoDB for Kona. We're seeing increased demand and interest for our services across the board. And then what we're hearing from the customers we want to avoid vendor lock-in. We don't want to have a proprietary software stack. We really need to decrease the money that we're paying uh, on licensing and support. And that's something that's super important right now. And then we're also hearing, of course, more chatter from our competitors about what we're doing. So this is, we see this as a huge opportunity to help the open source community overall and help continue our growth in MongoDB area. And the, the reason for this is, is pretty simple. Here's a particular trend. If you look at commercial licenses, you can see the popularity for that has decreased significantly. You know, beginning back in 2013, you know, it's somewhat flattened out, but it's still on a decreasing pattern. But at the same time, the open source license is increasing the interest for those and the popularity for those. And so, I mentioned this before, you know, every year we put out our open source data management software server resorts, results, and those just came in. So 41% of the buying decisions are now made by architects. That gives them a significant power, and that's a huge shift from where we were before. Okay. And where is it coming from? It's not coming from little green men, all right? So the operations continue. To, to grow, to struggle to grow, control the, the growing cloud spin. Cloud to say, hey, everybody go to cloud. It's cheap, it's convenient, it's there, but it's so easy for those costs to spiral and to get out of control. Companies are spending significantly more than they thought that they would or that they planned that they would be doing such a thing. You can see that there here over the next, this is organizational spend on public cloud, all right? It's current spend, they're expected that to grow 47% over the next 12 months. And then current cloud, their budget was this, and in general, on average, they're spending 23% more of that. And so the whole fallacy of, okay, okay, great, we need more capacity, we can just auto scale. We'll auto scale up or we'll auto scale down. 
But a lot of times when you're doing that, you're not solving the underlying performance problems and you're just causing price increases that you're not really wanting to handle or, or needing to handle at this particular time. So with the fact that we talked about earlier, the continued growth, the expected growth, this is just a fact from our, thing, from our people, from our constituents, from our customers. 82% said that they at least a 5% database footprint growth last year. 62% said even more, so even more, growing over 50%. So you see, this is something that's not gonna go away. People are gonna have to keep dealing with it and helping our customers to make sure they can handle it as well. If people are using open source, you tend to continue to want to use open source. So if you're using open source tools, if you're using open source tech databases, you're probably going to want to use open source tools. So 60%, and that's confirmed here, 66% of respondents did that same thing. Adopt open source database tools, observation for monitoring and alerting. A huge concern right now, and this is for everyone and across the board, but everywhere, but open source database software is allowing people, allowing our customers to save money. Right. And 81% and are saying that the cost is a huge driver. So you can see the quote here. Thank you for Kona for your contributions. Thank you for giving awesome tools, software. There's a lot of confidence in the community and to open source database technologies. So that tells you we are kind of known as the experts and not kind of. And to that same end, take a look at the adoption rates for the different uh, databases versions of MongoDB, so to speak. So are MongoDB compatible? So this does include Amazon DocumentDB and Azure Cosmos, right? So the community edition for open source is 36%. MongoDB Enterprise Edition, 8%. For Kana Server, 8%. So here's a quote from a particular uh, customer. We've used open source software as much as we can for operations, saving hundreds of thousands of dollars in the process. Though some additional investment and time is needed to learn and implement the software, it's important to note that for the most part, we've deployed and not, did not have to even touch the systems except for upgrades and patches. So we think about that for a second, because everyone's like so afraid of leaving the enterprise level software. But in reality, it's almost like anything else. If you put a little bit of time up front, if you plan, if you actually think about the schema or think about your shard key and do the things that you need to do up front, it's super important and it's going to end up paying, paying dividends for you. So when this takes us back to this, to the same thing, okay. All these different databases, we're using more and more software, more and more open source. And so what does that tell us? This is a stat from last year, where the multi-database is still the king, using more than one open source database. You can type multiple open source database products, 89%. Multiple database products, meaning most likely, you know, Oracle or one of the other relational databases, 92%. So non-relational databases, 54%. And actually these figures have remained pretty constant. Uh, even through to this next year. So what are the specific databases in the combinations that we're doing? The most popular combinations, MySQL and MongoDB, MySQL and Postgres, MongoDB, Postgres, MongoDB, Redis, and then the combinations in this combination. So MongoDB in and of itself is still very, very popular for developers and for enterprises. Remember that 65,000 the most wanted database stack that I mentioned earlier. Okay, but it's even more popular. It's 24% on its own, but it's even more popular when paired with another DB. From our survey this year, MongoDB and Postgres last year, 24% combination, but then MongoDB and Postgres this year, 30%. So you see that's kind of growing and improving. Okay. And so, this takes back to the, the age old thing, uh, way back when I first started productions and presentations and, and learning about the different types of NoSQL database. Polyglot persistence was a very, you know, fun word. So using the best tool for the job at hand, using the best database for what you do. And just a, a visual depiction of that for all your different types. Here's, here's a quick look at that, okay? So your application, your web services, your data access logics, all built in here modularized microservices, and then 
your Calm Family database like Cassandra, graph database like Neo4j, any relational database, you know, MySQL, Postgres, et cetera, and then your document database or key value store. Pick the database technology that best fits and then use multiple databases for, before you go from there. So when you have to use that many databases, who's gonna, do, who's gonna support them all? How are you going to do that? Do you have your in-house expertise? Or are you gonna to have to have hire multiple different people? Most of the time, companies don't have the time, the resources, or even the desire to speak. So luckily there's someone around that can help out with that. Here's another interesting thing that, that just kind of came up. And actually, as you can see, it came up today. Most open source startup companies are outside the Bay Area. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Many of them are European and they're avoiding venture capital funding. So 90% of the fastest growing open source companies are outside of the San Francisco Bay Area. 12 of them are in Europe, four in the USA, three in France, three in Germany, et cetera, et cetera, and just kind of keep going down. But I thought that was just an interesting enough fact to, to share uh, with you before we go back to talking about the database technologies. So here, they, it's not just for Kona that's coming up with these. You see database engines, you also see Stack Overflow. And here are the top databases, the top seven in each one. MySQL, Postgres, Redis, Maria, Elastic, Mongo, Kafka. MySQL, Postgres, Mongo, Elastic, Redis, Cassandra, MariaDB. MySQL, Postgres, Mongo. So you see the common theme here of the things we're working. And the, the point here that's super important to make is that for Kona supports three of those. MySQL, Postgres, MongoDB, and actually MariaDB. So right there. So who, who's, who's there to take care of what you're gonna need? We are your unbiased, except of course, you know, we think we are experts, which is true, but unbiased open source database experts. You can see here, we'll help you eliminate your vendor lock-in, help you embrace the crowd, cloud, or also be on premise. As we do, we're agnostic with regard to that. We're here to help you make sure your database is running optimally and help you reduce your cost and your complexity. Okay, so that's pretty much just what we're saying again. So here, let's talk about the Procona vision specifically. We want to provide truly open enterprise class MongoDB software and tools with our team of experts, and then we have support, professional service, managed services offering. You know, Procona just started a managed service offering for MongoDB in, in May. And yet we've added all these resources to help support that. We also have the products to self support it. Procona distribution for Mongo, which includes your server, from, Procona server for MongoDB, Procona backups for MongoDB. You heard earlier, you heard Rick talk about Kubernetes and the Kubernetes operator, and then PMM, the improvements that have come out for there. Let me take a quick look at that. But before we do that, Percona, it is, the Percona server for MongoDB is a fully compatible drop-in replacement for the community edition. 100% open source, so it's free. We want to give back to the community. We want to continue the open source mindset and help development happen faster because of that. And it works on-premise, works in the cloud, and or in a hybrid situation. The other thing that it does, it brings enterprise class features to the common free version. And that's for LDAP, uh, HashiCorp Vault, data at rest, audit logging, and then also you'll see some just see backup improvements. Here's a comparison that shows you exactly what you're getting with each. So the community edition doesn't have LDAP, doesn't have auth, doesn't have the encryption at rest doesn't have auditing or log reaction. It's free. The, Mon the MongoDB Enterprise Edition has all of these things, but it does have your high license costs. And then your Procona server for MongoDB. Again, we have enterprise class features that are included for no additional costs. So that's kind of the things we talk about as being important. And then we also have the tools. So this is, you know, there was a whole presentation on PMM. There was whole, you know, announcements on the new things that are coming out. We have the PMM. So that's super important. 
you take a look here, the all new MongoDB exporter, okay, data to enable the exploration, and then as well, the query analytics improvements, uh, unlocking for MongoDB explain, MongoDB explain plan. So the earlier presentation for Branham, and the announcement for PNM, PNM, and then that's what gets you there. So we have all these different things that are important and they help you out. Then we also have things that are coming in PNM. All right, so their initial focus, this is just a quick look, obviously things that have been talked about and then our longer term focus for more. So what does that all mean? What does it mean for you? What does it mean for Rakana? What are you here to take away? And basically what's Rakana doing? Mondo is not going anywhere. It's the most wanted database. Data is going to continue to grow. The decision makers are no longer the DBAs. So you're going to need help. People need help. People need guidance. They need best practices, et cetera. Open source databases are super important right now because everyone's concerned for cost. Again, 81% are very cost conscious, and that's one of the primary drivers for open source databases. Why Percona? Why MongoDB at Percona? Percona is known to be the open source database experts. Percona's server for MongoDB is the full drop-in replacement for the community edition and get the enterprise features, including all the security. Get the improvements to PMM, Percona backup, and then we've also got the upcoming Percona enterprise platform beta uh, that was mentioned earlier in the conference, along with Kubernetes operator Throw in that at the end, and you've also professional services, managed services, and support. So those are the different things that we have to offer and kind of where we're going. And you know, it's pretty super important. So again, these are the things that we can do for you. I think that that's all. Um, you know, thanks again for taking the time to, to be here. And sorry about the apologies for the voice, uh, but hopefully we're good.